Hi everybody, my name is Andre and welcome back to Med School EU. Today we're doing another educational video and it's going to be on the physiology of digestion. First, we are going to talk about the types of macromolecules that we ingest into our bodies through the mouth and uh, which type of macromolecules that we consume that will have to be broken down, digested, and absorbed within our digestive tract. And all of the anatomical parts that we described in our previous lecture, as this is part two of the digestive system, will be used in uh, this lecture to depict the physiology of those structures. Now talking about the macromolecules, we've got three main types of macromolecules that come through our bodies and uh, we take out energy from these carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins in order to fulfill our basic cellular functions. So they'll go from the polysaccharides to the disaccharides and finally into monosaccharides and these things will be uh, happening through uh, digestive enzymes. And we're going to talk about all of those in, in great detail today. Now, in terms of lipids, they would be uh, mainly uh, fats that will be coming through our digestive tract. And primarily, they'll be broken down into glycerol and fatty acids. And finally, proteins will be uh, broken down into simpler uh, proteins or simpler peptides. Uh, however, um, most likely in the, in the very end, the end of the entire digestive tract, uh, we will have amino acids. So the, the general st structure of uh, proteins is that they would be polypeptides into dipeptides, and then they would be broken down into singular peptide molecules, which would be the amino acids. And we can use these monosaccharides, which would be things like glucose and fructose, and we can use glycerol and fatty acids and amino acids to uh, for energy and to fulfill other basic metabolic functions. Now let's talk about the digestion of these mo macromolecules. And we first begin digestion in the mouth. Of course, uh, most predominantly the mouth digestion involves mechanical digestion as we are going to be breaking food down into smaller pieces mechanically with our teeth. And there's also going to be a chemical digestion in the mouth occurring as well. And chemical digestion mainly would involve enzymes. And so what type of enzymes are going to be used in uh, the mouth to begin our chemical digestion? And that's going to be two main types. And it's there's going to be salivary amylase, and so what the salivary amylase does is it breaks down starch and glycogen, which are polysaccharides, into maltose. Another enzyme that will be released is called salivary uh, lipase. And this enzyme that is released in the mouth, the salivary lipase will not be activated until it reaches the stomach because this uh, enzyme, the lipase, is only activated at a lower pH when pH is closer to 3 and 4 range as, as it would be in the stomach. In the mouth, the pH is not that low. In the mouth, it's closer to 7, neutral pH. And therefore, lipase, the enzyme is not going to be active. It's not actually going to be doing any chemical digestion at all. However, just to note, it is released along with the saliva. So now let's talk about the saliva and where it comes from and where it is released. And we've mentioned these structures before, the salivary glands. So we've got the parotid gland. Next, we got the submandibular. And finally, this little one right here is called the sublingual. And so these three salivary glands are going to release saliva. And so let's talk about the contents of saliva. They include 99% of water. So it's comprised 99%, uh, it's made up of 99% of water, but the other percent is electrolytes. It also releases mucus. It releases an antibody called IgA, and we're going to talk about that in, with, within the immune response. Of course, it releases the enzymes that we just talked about, which uh, would be 
the amylase and lipase amylase breaks down starch and glycogen polysaccharides into maltose and a lipase is going to be the enzyme that breaks down fats but it's only going to be activated in the acidic stomach and also another interesting uh, factor that it releases is called the lysozyme and this would be part of the uh, Im immune response of the body that saliva contains lysozyme which is an antimicrobial agent and so of course when we ingest food naturally you're going to get bacteria you're going to get viruses you're going to get microbes that enter into the body and so these lysozymes are there in the saliva so they can kill off all these uh, microorganisms that are not welcome in the body and they can do harm so now let's talk about the digestion within the stomach and this uh, can start to get a little bit more complicated and this is why it's important to discuss and debunk those things so in the stomach, stomach contains gastric glands. These glands are all over the, the stomach and they're going to release gastric juices. However, the release of gastric juices is going to be stimulated by hormone called gastrin. And gastrin is going to enter the bloodstream and stimulate the stomach uh, uh, and the stomach uh, gastric glands to release these gastric juices if food enters into the stomach and gastrin plays a role in having uh, the stomach become acidic in order to receive that food and be able to create something called chyme so chyme is kind of a mesh between gastric juices and the broken down uh, things that have come down from the mouth so your the food that is mechanically broken down and that contains the amylase it's going to come down to the stomach and it's going to mix with these gastric juices and it together that is called chyme now let's talk about the components of the gastric juices first we must mention that it releases something called mucin and mucin is, is a structure that protects the walls of the stomach next we've got the pepsin enzyme and the function of the pepsin enzyme is to break down proteins into peptides so these large protein structures are going to be broken down into smaller peptides and primarily what's important to know is that this pepsin enzyme is going to act in the stomach because a lot of enzymes that will be released into the stomach are not actually going to act in the stomach. They will only be activated in the small intestine and we will get to that. However, this pepsin enzyme is specifically released and activated in the stomach by the gastric juices that will break down proteins into peptides. So there is a breakdown. We finally getting a breakdown of proteins, whereas in the mouth, all we got was a breakdown of these polysaccharides these huge carbohydrates into smaller carbohydrates however we did not break down any proteins or fats and so in the gastric with the gastric juices forming chyme inside the stomach we have the pepsin enzyme that will promote uh, protein uh, degradation into peptides and uh, we're going to have this formation of chyme Another thing that's released, of course, is the hydrochloric acid that makes the stomach acidic for these enzymes to actually work because pepsin only works in an acidic environment along with uh, HCl. And it releases lipases. However, lipases do not work within the stomach. They work at a pH of closer to the neutral and therefore it is released in the stomach however it will act only in the smaller intestine and the purpose of lipases is to break down fats into glycerol and fatty acids now moving on to the small intestine and uh, th there's quite a lot that happens here probably the most out of any place in the digestive system so in the smaller intestine that is the place where most of the molecules are digested and broken down this is this is the place where all of this emulsion and all of these structures that we haven't broken down yet they're going to be broken down and there's going to be a variety of enzymes involved and we're going to talk about all of them now before i get into the digestion part i need to talk about 
uh, how things are released and how the accessory organs are involved in all of this. So what occurs is that chyme is going to enter the duodenum, which is the first part of the small intestine. It is the widest part of small intestine. And it is also the shortest part of the small intestine. However, that is the place where most of the breakdown of the digestion of the molecules will occur. And as soon as chyme enters the duodenum, it stimulates the secretion of a hormone called secretin. And so secretin will be released from the duodenum. It will enter the blood. So this, this hormone travels through the bloodstream. It will enter the blood and it will circulate and come through to the pancreas. Now the pancreas, it's going to stimulate the pancreas to release uh, NaCO3 and sodium bicarbonate, which will be buffers in order to raise the pH from 2 to about 8. So actually inside the duodenum, the chyme will be basic instead of acidic because we have a problem here. We have chyme that is at 2 pH entering a, a layer of smooth muscle and endothelium that is not able to ha handle the uh, this acidity. It would just burn right through it. And so the first thing that occurs is secretin is released from the small intestine, from the duodenum, enters the bloodstream, and stimulates pancreas to release sodium bicarbonate. And this sodium bicarbonate will act like a buffer to promote the change in pH from 2 to 8. And now the, uh, the chyme that is inside the duodenum will be within the 8 pH range. And therefore, a lot of these enzymes that were previously released in the mouth and the stomach will then be able to be activated and act on these molecules, on these macromolecules that we have. Now, there's also going to be another hormone called CCK. So CCK, along with secretin, will cause two things. It will cause the pancreas to release enzymes. So it will cause the release of pancreatic juice, which includes uh, all of these enzymes that we'll discuss. And it also causes the gallbladder to release bile. So just in summary, what's going on is the liver always produces bile, and that's what we talked about in the last lecture. And it is going to be stored in the gallbladder, this little sac right here. So what occurs as soon as food enters the duodenum, it goes through the, the sphincter from the stomach, and it enters the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine, is that it secretes the hormone secretin from the small intestine. It enters the bloodstream and then it influences the pancreas. And it stimulates the pancreas to release sodium bicarbonate, which will cause the pH of chyme to go from 2 to 8. And now all the enzymes that are released from the pancreas uh, due to CCK and, secre and secretin uh, the pancreas is going to release a pancreatic juice, which includes lots of enzymes that will promote the breakdown or digestion of these macromolecules. At the same time, the CCK is, and secretin, specifically the secretin, is going to promote the, the, the gallbladder to release bile. Again, gallbladder is the place where bile is uh, stored. So now let's talk about the enzymes that are released in general throughout the entire di digestive system. And so we've talked about some of those already, but I wanted to go through the entire chart and uh, explain what's the purpose of them, where they come from, and what do they form. Now the first one here that's released in a place where it acts is in the mouth. And that's the one we discussed already that breaks down starch and glycogen into maltose. Now that's, that's released from the salivary glands and that's of course going to be the salivary amylase. Now the next one on the list that will be released from the gastric juices, it's a product of, of pepsinogen and hydrochloric acid that is part of the uh, stomach juice. So the gastric juice is released by the gastric glands in the stomach and it acts in the stomach. And what it does is it uh, breaks down protein into peptides. Now this one we already talked about, and that's going to be the pepsin enzyme. Now the, also secreted by the stomach glands um, is going to be the 
lipases. So lipases are going to break down fats into glycerol and fatty acids. However, remember, even though it is released in the stomach, its action is going to be in the small intestine because the stomach is too acidic. So as soon as it reaches that pH of 8 in the range of 8 instead of 2, the lipases will actually activate and they will begin their action in the small intestine. However, they are, the gastric lipases are released in the stomach from the gastric glands. Now looking at the rest of this list, most of these enzymes are going to be uh, produced and, and released by the pancreas. And this comes from the pancreatic juices. So this one right here that breaks down starch into maltose is going to be pancreatic amylase. So also an amylase. However, it's going to be pancreatic. Next, uh, from fat to glycerol and fatty acids will be pancreatic lipase. Now this next one right here is an interesting one because it is a product of trypsinogen, which is uh, the inactive form of the enzyme that's released from the pancreas, and the enterokinase from the walls of duodenum that's going to form trypsin. And the function of trypsin is to promote the breakdown of peptides into simpler peptides. Now another one with a similar sort of path is the product of trypsin and chymotrypsinogen that will form chymotrypsin. And this one's also released from the pancreas that will do exactly the same thing as trypsin, but within uh, different uh, peptides. Now the next one that will do a very similar function as the trypsin and the chymotrypsin, also released from the pancreas, that will break down peptides into simpler peptides, is going to be called carboxypeptidase. Now this one is easy, is also released from the pancreas, breaks down ribonucleic acid into nucleotides, uh, that is a component of our DNA, so the basic unit of DNA and RNA is going to be nucleotides, and so the enzyme that is released by the pancreas in order to do this breakdown is called carboxypeptidase. Now the next one here is interesting because it's also released by the pancreas, but it's not going to break down one of those macromolecules that we've been talking about, but it's going to break down ribonucleic acid into nucleotides. So, of course, if you're eating things like cells, like muscle cells, if you're eating uh, chicken or uh, you're eating anything else that's going to have some ribonucleic acid in it and it's going to have some uh, DNA in it. So it's going to have RNA and DNA and those also need to be broken down into its components, which would be nucleotides. Now those are going to be broken down by ribonuclease, the RNA, and the DNA will be broken down by deoxyribonuclease. Now looking at the uh, small intestine, because the walls of the small intestine will also have glands that are also going to release enzymes to break down peptides and uh, different sugars into even smaller components for absorption. So here what we have in the first one is the peptides into simpler peptides is going to be done by aminopeptidase. The next one here, the tripeptides that are broken down into dipeptide and amino acid will be done by tri tripeptidase. So now looking at the last three, these are going to be the breakdown of carbohydrates, so sugars. And as you can see here, the, the starch and the glycogen originally uh, was broken down into maltose by amylase. And now it traveled all the way to the small intestine. And now this maltose is ready to be broken down into its smaller components, the monosaccharides, which would be two glucose, the sucrose broken down into glucose and fructose, and lactose broken down into glucose and galactose. These are also released by the internal glands and the glands inside the small intestine. So here it says internal glands, that's also within the small intestine and the duodenum. And so what are their names? Well, uh, maltose will be broken down by maltase, the sucrose broken down by sucrase, and lactose broken down by lactase. So these are the major enzymes that are used 
and that are released within the small intestine, the pancreas, and the mouth, and the stomach as well. So we went through all of these structures. We went through how these re enzymes are released, when they're released, and due to what actions of which hormones. And now here is a summary of what these enzymes do and what their function is and their origin of, of release. So I suggest that you memorize the general uh, aspect of these enzymes, like what an amylase does, what lipases do, uh, what the a ribonuclease does, deoxyribonuclease. You gotta know just the general uh, names and what they do and what they break things down into. So those are important to memorize by heart. Now the next cool thing I wanted to talk about is what's inside these small intestines and uh, what are these structures actually look like and how are they able to absorb things and digest things at such great uh, efficiency? And the reason for that is these enterocytes. And so uh, enterocytes are basically these uh, large uh, villi, right? So they would be these projections. They're, they would be all over the uh, small intestine. And each of these small projections has even smaller projections inside called the microvilli and so we're going to go over these and we're going to discuss uh, the purpose of them and uh, how they're able to digest and absorb a lot of these structures that we're talking about and how it's going to enter the bloodstream for us to distribute throughout the body and distribute that energy that we have created and so let's go through the anatomy of these structures uh, this is called the villus or villi in plural. And what they contain around them is going to be this structure of arteries. So that this is gonna be an arterial. And this is gonna be a vein. And in essence, this provides uh, oxygen supply and a nutrient supply to the villus inside the small intestine. And it's going to distribute uh, nutrients for these cells to work, but it's also going to take up nutrients from uh, these these cells. And I'm going to show uh, exactly how these things occur. But basically, uh, it's going to take up nutrients that are brushing against the villus and in, in the or the villi in the small intestines, and it will be taken up by the vein, and it will enter these the bloodstream and then it's going to be distributed to the liver to our muscle cells and all over the place that will be necessary uh, to take those nutrients but i also wanted to discuss a zoomed in version of these microvilli these microvilli are called enterocytes and i've got the name right here so these enterocytes uh, they have something called a brush border and within this brush border, the, these uh, little lines that I drew here, uh, that basically signifies the glycocolyx. And that's just basically a large structure of a sugar. And of course, we've got the cytoplasm here. Uh, these are the mitochondria. And we've got the Golgi apparatus, the cell nucleus and the endoplasmic reticulum so this is just like a regular cell however it is more specialized as it is specialized to uh, absorb and break down more carbohydrates and more fats and more proteins and how this is done is basically these monosaccharides uh, enter the glycocolics and they enter the brush border right so we've got our saccharides and they're going to enter in through these transporters called glute transporters and these glute transporters exist on the small intestine they exist in the liver and they exist in skeletal muscle wherever uh, the carbohydrates are being taken up it's typically done through a glute transporter and it's going to be taken up right into the blood so through all of these tiny little microvilli uh, these uh, Carbohydrates are going to be taken up into the blood, into the vein, and it's going to travel through the bloodstream until it reaches the organ it needs to go to. And then also the fat is going to enter in through here as well, and it's going to travel to the lymphatic system. So this structure right in the middle that I have created 
is depicted as the uh, lymph system. And this lymphatic vessel collects fats. So the fats would not typically go through uh, the bloodstream. It's not going to dissolve there. It, remember, fat is water-fearing, and since our bloodstream is primarily made up of, of water, the blood plasma at least, it's not going to go through there. It's going to go through the lymphatic uh, system, and it's then going to also distribute throughout the body as the lymphatic system is quite extensive as well. Now, in terms of the digestion within the large intestine, there isn't going to be too much digestion going on because there's going to be no enzymes released. So these enzymes uh, would have done their job within the small intestine. That's why it's so extensive, it's so long. And once it enters the cecum and it goes through the ascending colon, transverse colon, and the descending colon, there's going to be no enzymes doing enzymatic activities. Uh, however, the primary function of the large intestine is going to be water absorption. So it's going to absorb uh, lots of water. However, there is going to be some uh, digestion and uh, more absorption of nutrients going on because of anaerobic bacteria. And these anaerobic bacteria are going to digest various uh, material. So they're still going to be doing digestion, however, not enzymes, but it will be anaerobic bacteria that live in our gut. And this anaerobic bacteria will promote digestion and it will also synthesize uh, things like vitamin B and vitamin K. And here I have a little diagram depicting the anatomy of the large intestine that we talked about in the previous lecture. So there isn't too much to note about digestion in terms of the large intestine because most of it is done in the smaller intestine, specifically the duodenum. However, uh, the, the primary reason for this large intestine and for it to be as long as it is, is to absorb a, a good amount of water. And so if typically a patient gets a diarrhea, uh, th that is because something is going on with the large intestine, there's an infection or uh, there's a viral uh, load that's going on inside the large intestine that is breaking down all of these structures that are within it that are not able to absorb enough water. This is why uh, the, the person gets uh, diarrheas. So in summary, the large intestine is not going to be uh, too involved in terms of digestion. The main purpose of it is going to be absorb water. The final thing I wanted to discuss is the liver because the liver is a, a fascinating organ that does quite a lot of things as, as it's depicted in this diagram. As you can see, it would have uh, glucose coming in through the blood vessel and the excess glucose will then be transformed either into fat, into fatty acids and glycerol, or it will be stored as glycogen. And then it would also promote the breakdown of glycogen into glucose if glucose is needed for the cells and etc. So there's lots of things going on. There's lots of pro processing. There's uh, anti-toxicity, so it breaks down toxins within the liver. There's lots of things going on within the liver. However, what we talked about uh, primarily in terms of digestion is that it releases bile salts and bile. And the purpose of bile salts and bile is that it causes the emulsion uh, in the small intestine. So these things are released into the small intestine and it causes the um, emulsification or emulsion in the small intestine using lipase. And the reason it does that is it breaks down fat globules into fat droplets. And so now uh, once the fat is in the form of fat droplets, it is able to be emulsified by uh, lipase. So lipase is actually activated by bile salts in the bile uh, because of the function that it does by breaking down the fat globules into smaller droplets, which are then able to be emulsified by the enzyme in the small intestine. So this concludes our unit on the digestive system and the uh, digestion and the anatomy and physiology of our digestive tract. The next topic that we will discuss is going to be the kidney, nephron anatomy, and excretion.